And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from the double-headed monster that is Adventure Slang Productions, and creators of the upcoming RPG Novarden, hoping I got that pronounced right, the one and only, D don't call him Roger, Ty Moore. How you doing, hey. today, man? Good, thank you. Uh, amen to that. Yeah, a uh, new Ovarden is uh, more a little bit more precise, but uh, well done. Yeah, uh, I've, it's one of those things where I'm kind, where I'm kind of flying blind on that front. <laughs> sure. <laughs> new name, new world. It it actually is meant to. Um, it's supposed to be an iteration of New Garden, and it's intended to be something of in the, the original language of the. Uh, original people in the setting, but it's also loosely a uh, form of Italian that means the same thing as well. Mm -hmm. Lord knows I've got no shortage of Italians that I've had in the temple. <laughs> I'm a percentage of that, but uh, <laughs> but I actually didn't come up with the name. Uh, my buddy Mike did, who's got, I think, a bit more Italian in him than I do. So yeah, yeah, Neo Varden. Uh, Neo Varden's a, a, a setting and system, um, both original creations, and uh, it is a well. The set, the system is what we call the Fortunes D four system. Mm -hmm. So it's actually just a pure D four system, and um, and then the setting is a strictly or a, a yeah strictly non medieval fantasy setting, mm -hmm. which we'll get we'll get to those things shortly. The first thing that I wanted to delve into is the origin story. So walk me through your um, introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Sure, yeah. Um, so I was a big fantasy guy in my childhood. Uh, Conan and, uh, of course, Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and things like that. Uh, and <clears throat> then Michael Moorcock in the Elric series and and uh quorum and all that kind of stuff and so i was my friends and i were into those stories and in middle school um junior high in where i lived in in idaho my friends came to me one day and they said hey there's this kid in the library who has who plays this game called dungeons and dragons and we want you to go talk to him and ask him if he'll teach you how to play it so you can show us and I was like, what is Dungeons and Dragons? And he's, they were like, well, it's, you know, it's these stories uh, in these books that we like so much. And I said, yeah, I'll go check it out. And so hey, I went in. The and ball I, guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I got elected for that uh, necessarily. Uh, maybe because they knew I would do the work. <laughs> so I went and I talked to him and I said, hey, can you teach me about this game? And I didn't know him that well. Um, but he was like, yeah, here. And he handed me like the blue cover of Beck, the, the basic. I don't remember what that specific. Beck me. Uh, yeah, it's Beck me for sure. Uh, the, uh, but the blue, you know, the blue one with the dragon on the front. And a copy of uh, Keep on the Borderlands and said, go over to the game store and get yourself, you know, with this kind of die and this kind of die and this kind of die and these all these funky sides. And they didn't have sets back then. This was 1983. Or, uh, is that right? Yeah, about 1983. And um, so I went and got dice and, you know, and that was all fascinating because, you know, who doesn't love the dice? And I read the rules. I read the basic rules. And I was like, hmm. So I called him up. He gave me his number. I called him up and I said, am I understanding this right? And he's like, yeah, just, you know, just put the players together and look on the map and see what's in that chamber and tell them that's what's there and follow the combat rules and whatever. And that's how we did it. So we started playing. So I became the dungeon master. And of course, as many, many role players have experienced, had that instantaneous uh, fascination with it, like the mind blowing experience um, and saying, wow. So all of these adventures and these stories and these things I had in my head now have a system to them that we can continue to play and have these experiences. And so we did keep on the borderlands. And then um, I just remember buying 
module after module and running them. And soon I had the hardcover uh, AD&D books. I skipped right from basic to advanced. I don't think I, I did any of the rest of the ECME. Um, and just went into the advanced stuff and um, collected the books and, and, and that and Gamma World. I picked up Gamma World right away um, and just explored the whole TSR thing uh, prior to going then into other systems as well. And I have to also acknowledge the Satanic Panic had a big role in why I explored other systems because I was uh, I hit that roadblock with my parents and uh, via my grandmother <laughs> who saw, I, I said, Grandma, look at all this cool stuff I have. And I laid out my Conan, Savage Sword of Conan comic books and my Dungeons and Dragons. And she was like, oh, and uh-huh. And then an hour later, my dad came and said, oh, you can't play that anymore. <laughs> oh. But you can play Gamma World. <laughs> I um, I got myself in a lot of trouble a long time ago when I when I said that the same the same people who who um who bought who bought into the satanic panic are the same because magic are the same people who will who will talk up about how magical Disney is. Yes. <laughs> yes, a bad thing. Yeah. You know. You oh. Know, it's, kind, it's kind of like a. I described it as imagine a Catholic giving up. Ga- Giving up gambling for Lent, and and that Catholic happens to be a stockbroker. Right. <laughs> you know, well, one's legal. <laughs> gambling, sure, no. gambling. Uh, yeah, correct. Um, and well, so the way that that things came around, then uh, we left Idaho. We moved to California. I got into, with a new group of kids. I was getting older, and. Um, I, so I came to, and I had friends that still played role playing games and things like that in my new place of living. And I also went to parties. And so I said, Dad, uh, you know, uh, maybe if I spend a little bit more time playing these games, a little less time at parties, you'll let me back into D and D. And he was like, okay, that's a good trade. And so I just did both. I stopped going to parties because I was always expected to be the guy, the guy holding the keys. And I was tired of fighting sure. people for their, for their keys. <laughs> yeah, um, which pro tip: if somebody, if somebody a foot, if somebody a foot and change taller than you says, "Give me your keys," he's not asking. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, although there was there was one person who thought who thought that he'd be who thought he'd be cute by um, trying to kick me below the belt when I was get, when when it came to getting the keys, mm-hmm. but um. This wasn't my first rodeo, so he didn't realize that I had come prepared. Yeah. Um. So what he ended up kicking was a metal cup. <laughs> you really knew what you were in for. <laughs> um. This is why we needed the keys. <laughs> You're not making wise choices, friend. <laughs> well, I um, I had to, I had spent I had spent some time lear- learning learning how to. How to put people into painful holds so I could, as a means to say, look, you either give me your key or you're going to lose your arm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh. And it's a fair trade. Yeah. Either give you give me your key or you're going to lose your arm, and I'm just going to take them anyways. <laughs> but I did have to deal with a bit of the. Even though I was born in '87, I did have to deal with a bit of the runoff of the Satanic Panic, but um. I think people I think people realize that I that um if you took if you took things away if you took it away from me then I'd then I'd find new and interesting ways to uh, to annoy you into getting it into me getting it back um cuz my yeah. school my school had um gotten on me for playing Magic the Gathering mm-hmm. growing up and even to the point where they threatened me where they threatened me with um with in school suspension so because of the fact that the argument was that I'm not allowed to play cards, the next weekend I bring in I bring in Yahtzee. <laughs> hey, this is a dice game. You said no cards. There's no cards in this. <laughs> so then the rules list becomes a mile long of everything that you're not allowed to bring. No Legos. <laughs> yeah. There are sto- there are stories of of um a of a coach in the early days of hockey who would find would find new and interesting ways to say there's no rule that says I can't do this 
just to make the just to make the NHL make a better rule book. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, uh, I mean it works. Yeah, but um, <clears throat> if you don't mind, give, given that origin, I'd like to play a bit of a lightning round with certain with certain names during the TSR era, and if you're familiar with the with these modules or these settings. Okay, I'll do my. I'll do, let me let me give it a shot. All right, let me start with something infamous: Tomb of Horrors. Okay, sure. Uh, I, I, the funny thing is, I actually didn't play that until um, about three years ago. <laughs> i.e., i.e., Gygax's version of the word "fuck you." Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, clearly. Um, well, that's and I didn't complete it either. Uh, probably to the benefit of my character. <laughs> well, the reason I say that is, I don't know. I don't know if this is actually the case, but the story I was always told was. Gygax made that module because his playtesters were saying that the modules he was putting them through were too easy. <laughs> Which, um, those are famous last words. Oh, yeah. No, with... <laughs> yeah, you, well, you don't say that to your dungeon master anyway. Maybe you don't say it to that to your dungeon master because you didn't say that to the original dungeon master. Uh, well, you shouldn't just say that for just by, just by virtue of you shouldn't tempt the gods of irony. For sure, yeah. Good point. <laughs> it's the reason I always get mad whenever somebody says, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> Let's find out. <laughs> oh. White Plume Mountain. Oh, I love that one. Uh, my, my buddy Mike and I have talked about that would be a great foundation piece for an actual good Dungeons & Dragons movie. All right. You know, you're going to you're going to get the artifacts. You're going to uh, a dangerous place. There's amazing stuff in it. That's a, a classic. Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. Another one. I well, being a Gamma World player, and uh, and I loved the Gamma World original. You know, the first edition crossover. Um, I didn't have a problem mixing my sci-fi and fantasy in that particular way, and that is probably my favorite original. A module of the whole lot which i can i can complete i can completely uh oh, understand understand that it's but i hear i hear i hear it being being people's favorite actually quite a bit mm -hmm. um i'll go i'll go with the original the original ravenloft yeah. Uh, again, of course, that's that's why we have the whole franchise. My my buddy Todd ran me through that and did such a good job making Strahd so creepy. That's what I remember from it. And I, I again don't remember completing that one, but I definitely remember that experience. I was in I was a senior in high school when I when I played that one. Mm -hmm. Now you did. I'd like now. I'd like to shift over into a f into a few examples of um, setting. And okay. I'll start with I'll start with one that I'm very fond of, um, Al Quadine. I don't. I can't really speak to it. Um, it, it might even be better if I just tell you well, the ones I do know from <laughs> from T and D because it's not as expansive. Maybe I am. After the first running the first modules and the early ones that I bought, I moved into writing my own stuff, mm -hmm. and then I just used existing settings to place it in. And this was this would have been like by the '90s I was doing that. So started I started playing in the early you know mid '80s, and then by the '90s I was just writing my own adventures. All right, um, Dark Sun. Never played it. All right, may as well go with something. Ridiculously gonzo, since you mentioned not having an issue mixing science fiction and fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, Spelljammer. I never got in. Got Spelljammer. Was Spelljammer actually in first edition stuff? Because I don't. I. It seems to me that's a second edition actual release. Is that right? Some of these were during the AD and D second edition days. Yeah. Oh. So so I quit when second edition was being released. Hmm. Um, part of the, you know, I had that one of those famous hiatuses. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I quit playing when second edition was coming out. Honestly, I, it irritated me because I didn't understand capitalism as well at the time. Um, and I had this entire immaculate collection. I had an autographed collection of deities and demigods from Zeb, Zeb Cook had uh, autographed it for me at uh, Dundracon and things like that. And so I had everything I needed for first edition. And then second edition started coming out. And I'm like, I'm not going to do this over again. You know, I've got kids <laughs> by then. And, uh, and so I actually skipped second, third, all the way through until fifth. And fifth is when I started, I came back to D and D. Now with that, with that in mind, you meant, you mentioned, you mentioned writing your own stuff and writing your own set setting was Nova was Novarden a exa a exam the fruit of that. Was it the? I'm sorry. Was it the what? The fr the fruit of that of that kind of writing. Oh, like, was it. this was Novarden a setting that you had been kicking around for the longest time, or were its origins a bit more recent? They are much more recent, actually. Um, it it there is a, a bit of a long story to that answer, and then there's the immediate story to that answer. Uh, New of Arden literally came out of a dream that I had. Um, after a discussion with my friend about player agency, oddly enough. Um, but I will say that when I, so when I started college, I went into college as an English major and I thought um, I wanted to create, uh, I wanted to do a whole world build and I hadn't ever done a whole world build. But as a, a someone who desired to write fiction um, and especially fantasy novels, I knew I needed to do that somehow, but I didn't have a real example for it. So I thought, well, it can't be this hard. I'll go to college and learn the easy route. <laughs> yeah, that's how Maybe naive I was. <laughs> Absolutely. And then I got into college and then I discovered the classics and the, you know, the Russians and the, the great American writers and literature and stuff like that. And I got sidetracked into that for a very long time. So New of Arden actually is the full circle come around to what I started to do when I went to college in the early 90s. Um, so that's the longer version of that answer. Um, so in a way, New of Arden is that, that brainchild of the, yeah, that full circle of of um, now understanding what world building is. Mm -hmm. Now, I will. I one thing that I did no, that I did note, um, aside from aside from the fact that it's very clear that you're that this is fantasy, but but far less medieval is is seeing a lot of DNA of um, the Fertile Crescent within the within what. What I could what I could see with the game, mm -hmm. and I know you had mentioned dipping into other games as the years went on. Did you ever dip into um, RuneQuest at any point? Uh, no, I, I'm familiar with the name, but I have not actually looked at or played that game. Yeah, that's what that's what immediately came to mind when I th when I looked at some of the art. So I I guess I'll chalk that up to coincidence or just me looking at way too many things. Well, I mean, I would say, you know, there, there are other um, media uh, overlaps, though. Um, and I mentioned some of them in the early part of the rules, such as uh, uh, Castlevania and Avatar, Last Airbender, and um, maybe even Monster Hunter video game. Um, and these aren't necessarily things that I love, love. I really like the action sequences in Castlevania, and that is probably the, the biggest... Um, kind of example I can give for the kinds of manifesting effects that the characters can do. Um, but even things like, um, you know, there's some influence maybe from uh, Valorian, the world of a, the planet of a thousand worlds or whatever they call it. Um, and so, you know, so a bit of a variety, but I wanted an, uh, an alien setting that was not, uh, not the full of, full of pot. yes. And all those tropes. Exactly. Which I always, uh, whenever I bring that kind of thing up, I always have to make clear I got I've got no beef with Tolkien specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, but the reason I use that phrase is out of a annoyance that there's this idea that 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 um that particular very Western European style of fantasy is what you have to do in order for it to be fantasy. 
Right. Yeah, and and obviously, I mean, it's 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 so rich. Obviously, and Tolkien had such a uh, a, a depth in um, his knowledge of classical literature, and and you know, I I actually found the source of his the dwarf names from the Hobbit in uh, Snorri Sturluson's work, who wrote uh, the Edda, most famously, the collection of Norse um, traditions and and mythologies. Um, the dwarf names, I think, because they're in there, <laughs> and that was written m- much earlier than Tolkien, are there. And Tolkien was such a you know classicist. Uh, but um, so so we have the whole European tradition, which is just super robust and has lasted you know all these years, uh, from Irish poetry and the whole European tradition, very influential on us. But I'm always looking for, and I'm you know I'm not saying it's not easy. I'm but I'm looking for that that paradigm of something fresh. Uh, I was just talking to my son about this not too long ago. Nir- what Nirvana did for you know with grunge and, and for music, or or uh, Gygax with the whole genre of role playing games. Anyway, branching that off of classic war game tabletop war games and things like that. Those big time shifts, and I'm not New of Arden's nowhere close to that. But I did want to go for a setting that was um, unique enough that it felt like what I wanted it to be, which is a, you know, a dimension, not just another Earth-like planet with humans on it. Yeah, it's, it's funny you bring that up because if I were to use another musical analogy going down that route, I'd probably use um, Keeper of the Seven Keys by Halloween. Mm. Oh, oh, nice. Classic, yeah. Because that, that, bas- that basically became the the standard bearer for a lot, for a lot of the direction that power metal would take would take in the years since and continues to as mm-hmm. well as the whole idea of doing these grand storytelling albums um Rhapsody did pretty well for themselves with that as well as um Balsagoth well and even Queensryche oh yeah right with Operation Mindcrime mm-hmm um, even Dream Theater has dipped into that with the with um, the Astonishing, mm-hmm. and Symphony X has, Symphony X and Camelot have have done their own takes based on based on classical literature. Um, Symphony X did an entire um, album based based on the Odyssey and and a different one on Paradise Lost. Right, and Maiden Maiden was also a great band for the literary approach. Yeah, in there. even though even though in the process they ended up pissing off the Herbert estate. Oh, I didn't know that they had gotten in trouble there. <laughs> well, you're familiar with the song "To Tame a Land," right? Yeah. If that's if it sounds like that song is supposed to be one giant Dune reference, well, the original name was supposed to be Dune, but <laughs> when they approached um, the Herbert estate about the matter, the response was. Herbert hates metal bands and especially and especially bands like Iron Maiden, and wow. he th- and he threatened to sue if they if they ever used that name, so they just went with the name to tame a land and did and didn't change anything else. <laughs> Beautiful, <laughs> I mean classic rock style. Mm-hmm. Uh but I I can definitely I can definitely understand that because for one having an idea of something fr- from a dream is is in good company because that's how Cameron get that was part of how Cameron got the idea for the Terminator was a was a fever dream where he had where he saw a skeleton coming out of flames. Oh, nice! I had um, not read that. And as far as as far as trying to trying to do something new in that regard what instantly comes to mind for me and I'm I'm not sure if you're familiar with this game um uh, is exalted which went out of its way to try and avo- to try and avoid the the um Tolkien melting pot and instead lean far more into manga inspirations as well as inspir- as well as more mythological inspirations especially Especially, um, 
again, Fertile Crescent and and some of the stuff in India and some of the stuff it, further into Asia. Oh, nice. Okay. Right. So, I, again, I don't know Exalted, but did it have, a, like, did the, the setting incorporate, um, a, was it still that familiar, like, magic system and things like that? Or did they also change Exalted, that around? Exalted, util, util, first off, Exalted wasn't a D&D &D thing. Um, oh, okay. It utilized the storytelling system, the same system that's in World of Darkness, mm -hmm. but there were a lot of modifications. Mm-hmm. To the point where it's basically impossible to try and cross over between the two games. Gotcha. Well, that's great. I mean, that's good. That's that makes it standalone. <laughs> I mean, in the early days, they hinted that Exalted was a prequel to World of Darkness, but that's never really stuck. Mm -hmm. And by the time Second Edition Exalted came around, that was pretty much abandoned. Okay. Oh. But getting getting for getting further into things, I I want to touch on the the primary mechanic that you ha that you have that sure. um that D four based system. And the first thing I first thing I feel I sh we should go into is why D fours. Yeah, uh, I, I get that question a lot. Sure, sure. Um, my first and primary reason is I wanted to see, I wanted to create as foundational a system as I could with the effort of keeping the mechanics out of the way of the narrative as much as possible. So not to, I didn't want to create just a pure narrative uh, driven game because that's essentially, um, you know, I shot you, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. We have to have dice. We have to have those uh, guiding systems that's what makes it a game um i wanted to i thought that the d4 would be um original because there aren't a ton of d4 systems there are a lot of d6 systems there are a fair number of d10 systems there are plenty of d20 systems there are a few d12 systems uh, i can't actually think of a d8 system but i imagine there's even some of those so you know system systems they have dice but the four, I, I thought that I could do something with the four that would give enough um, functionality without making it so crunchy that it it was. I, I was just trying to avoid the crunch. I, I wanted to give agency to the players without creating a bunch of hoops to jump through. Um, say and that's that, how we ended up. Would you say that your D4 system is intended to be a crunch medium game? Yes, I would definitely say that. I, I thought initially it'd be light, but as we looked at the D4 and what you can do with it and, and how the math works, um, it needed to be modified, obviously. That's what game design is. Mm -hmm. And through that process, we ended up with a, a bit more of a rules medium system. Exactly. And now, give, now given that the way, if I, understa if I understand it, um, the system, which you call the Fortunes D4, with rare exception, you're going to be rolling two D4s. Right. And well, it. I mean, it, there is some variation there, but go ahead with your question. Sorry. Well, I wanted to use that as a baseline because because I think I think uh, I think a lot of game design with with role playing games over the years has evolved into a all roads lead to Rome kind of system. Mm -hmm. Contrast that with how, with how say early D and D looked where you had a collection of subsystems as an artifact of the war gaming days, mm -hmm. as opposed to, well, if you look at mod, if you look at, since you brought up fifth edition, every, the majority of die rolls with some rare, rare exceptions Begin and end with a roll high D twenty. Right. Um, World of Darkness. It's always a a um, success based die pool of D tens. Um, mm -hmm. Gamma World was a percentile system. Everything revolved around the percentile die. Mm -hmm. That's kind. That's kind of what I'm. That's kind of the baseline that I'm going with this. Right. So 
Yeah. So with fortunes, it's uh, well, what you're the four is the penultimate. Uh, penultimate. That's what you're trying to get for your success. Um, it could have been the one, but I went with the four. And the idea there is from the very first level, which we call evolutions. Uh, the first evolution, you get two dice right off the bat, and you have the option of rolling, having two actions and rolling one die for each, or combining your roll into one and only you have, only using one action on your turn with a higher chance of success. Um, that gives already a couple of options to the player. Do I want to take two actions this time or do I want to take one? In addition, we have a uh, assist roll mechanic where you can actually hold one of your dice back in the cache. And then when one of your allies at the table makes a roll, you can throw in on that roll if necessary to try and affect the outcome that way as well. So from a low level, at a low level, you still have some struggle, which you should, I think, at a low level. Um, but we also have the primacy scale. And the primacy scale is a renewable resource that allows you to influence the role so that if you don't get the role you want, you can bump it um, to, to get the success or at least to keep yourself out of trouble because we've got high failure, standard failure, and high success. And then with two dice, we've got a doubles mechanic as well. So the doubles in the mid-range, um, they afford you a different benefit, even if you didn't succeed on the task that you were trying to accomplish. So you've got this now, this combination of choice in how many dice you're going to roll, and then the primacy scale to affect the roll, and then potentially also an ally assist to further affect the roll, depending on what's going on, how dire the act is, what you need to do to accomplish, and and so forth. So with a high a high failure, you could actually you can actually harm yourself. Uh, we call it a reprisal. Um, with a standard failure, you just miss. And then with success, and then on double fours, it's a high success, then you get the old, you know, the ultimate uh, benefit. Mm -hmm. Now, given that, it, you, given that it talks about eight cultures, each empowered by a discipline and an innate ability, uh, I'd like to touch a little bit on the whole concept of discipline, because one thing that... I think a lot of people, even even veterans of a variety of tabletop, um, will probably notice that isn't present is the tip is the typical formula of attributes and skills. Right. Instead, yeah. instead, instead, so much seems to revolve around the choice of disciplines and the manifestations therein. Correct. Yes. So, and and that ties into the lore and the setting. Um, in this particular instance. So uh, quick backstory, New of Arden is a dimension. It was a kind of a Garden of Eden for the people that were there originally. They were very humanoid, uh, called the Lamplac, uh, which in their language means land place. They're the people of the land. And they had very little struggle. Um, there was no darkness, no nighttime, no need for uh, sleep, things like that. And then a, uh, another culture came in, the Starnum, who came in from outside of their dimension and had this manifesting ability. Um, as they started using this manifestation ability throughout the garden, um, the Lamplack people were kind of put off by it, didn't know what to make of it, but the garden itself absorbed that power. And as it absorbed that power and took it away from the Starnum, um, it imbued other aspects of reality with that power. And that's how you got the additional cultures. And so then the cultures have those specific disciplines that represent who they are. Um, so within a given culture, the general population only has that discipline and they don't evolve from that because they're not explorers. They're not going out into the land. They're not becoming heroes. Mm -hmm. um, but the heroes, as they, they travel about and they use this discipline and they evolve, they then absorb other disciplines. And so then they become more rounded and gain their powers that way. So rather than having classes and abilities, um, the players are left with their imagination. And what, the, what replaces class and ability is the structure of what you can do with a manifestation based on that discipline, whether it's in the element or whether it's in the aesthetic of song, your voice, or the aesthetic of silence, it's opposite. Um, and, you know, and so forth. And so it's a mix between um, physicality, 
which is something everyone has the ability to do, but they may or may not be good at it, as with the body discipline. And then this manifesting ability, which is essentially the magic system, which is this ability to create what you need or what you want out of thin air in the time that you need it. And then, of course, it's limited by the area you can affect or how long it lasts and what it costs to, to maintain it and, and all sorts of things like that. Now, with that, with that in mind, just based on the way you describe the disciplines, I'm guessing this is where part of the Avatar DNA came from because of the fact that there, that even with just one bending style, there's so many different things that are seen um, in its use. Mm-hmm. To the point where trying to create a list of effects would be a bit exhaustive, even though you're kind of doing that, but not in the same way. Yeah. So what we've done is we've created some some examples, mm-hmm. and in the system we encourage new players to rely on those until they get familiar enough with what does it mean if I want to try something new that's not actually defined in here. Like what are the what's the precedent? Um, you know, and the elemental, the Lenai, the, um, who are the element discipline, they're most like an avatar because they are doing, you know, fire, water, earth, stuff like that. But we also have the Kakuts, the silence, the ones who move about the shadows, who can literally move themselves from one shadowy corner to another um, without having to cross the open light or something like that, you know, or the, uh, the, the Ixia, who are the mystery, the ones who can open dimensional doorways into other other realms or can, um, t- you know, teleport themselves or turn invisible and things like that. So we have some familiarity in some of the abilities that you can do, but they're not, it doesn't end there. So it's like what, you know, as you become an experienced player and as your character becomes more powerful, if you've got an idea, talk it over with the seer, who's our GM, and you negotiate the outcome and what it's going to look like based on the structure of the rules, and then you make the role. And then the role determines your success. Mm-hmm. Now, when when it comes to your cho- when it comes to your choice of species of um species, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that primarily determines your start your starting your starting discipline and and potential manifestations. Right. Yeah. So you're so you, you choose your culture, and the culture has a core discipline. And then the thing that you keep in mind is as your your character evolves, the way the the system is set up, each discipline, there are eight disciplines, each one has an an opposing discipline. So as you evolve, you can select any new discipline at every odd evolution, um, but you can't select the opposing discipline of any discipline you already have until eighth evolution, which is the highest on the scale where you can then choose your fifth evolution in any of the remaining. So you end up with five evolu- or five disciplines at the highest level of evolution. And, uh, and then you've got you know, quite a robust um, build, but you don't have everything. Yeah. And so it, it allows some customization there in some very subtle, but I think very creative and uh, satisfying ways. Mm-hmm. Now, taking that into account, the other... Something that one particular thing that I was curious about is it seems that the primary extra effort or, e- or even ju- or even just ability resource is PS. Yeah. And I'm cur- I'm curious how it is that would that be similar to magic points a or an enhancement system? How how does that interact with disciplines? Yeah, it's absolutely an enhancement system. So what it is, is it's a buff when the dice don't cooperate, basically. Um, so, you know, you start, and we've actually changed the scale, changed the scale a little bit from the quick start that's on the website right now um, to increase that number a little bit. So you, you don't have a ton of those points, but you can recover them in various ways. And if by no other means than after your repose, which is essentially your long rest. But in the meantime, you have this pool of points. So when you roll the dice, um, you know, you've got a, on one die, you've got a 25% chance to succeed, which isn't great. 
but now with your primacy scale, you automatically bump that to a 50 um, just by having that resource. And it allows you to at least avoid that um, high failure if you roll the one, which then puts you at risk of injury. Uh, if you roll two dice, then with primacy, your percentage goes up, I believe, to 70%, um, which isn't a, a home run slam dunk every time, which you don't want. But it also allows enough potential that you're going to succeed on what you're trying the majority of the time, which as players, that's a satisfying thing to do. Um, you know, And then the counter to that, of course, is that the monsters don't actually manifest um, willy-nilly. Each monster in our design has unique abilities that kind of feel like manifestations, but they are specific to those creatures. And um, in various ways, they can mess with your primacy. They can mess with your manifesting ability and and do things that are unexpected that um, in some cases the players or the characters cannot even do. Mm -hmm. And based on, based on what, based on the way that it's present, that is presented, um, I'm gu I'm guessing that the man that the manifestations that are listed in the quick start are meant to be guidelines for how for how to utilize that discipline rather than a hard and fast list of effects. Yeah. So yeah, they are the they're intended, and we're actually going to emphasize this more in the final uh, development. Like, what does it mean to have this list of things? Because it's easy for a new player to see that as conclusive as like the be all end all. And it kind of feels like that in some of the disciplines because there's a lot of options there. Um, but we don't, we never want the players, especially when they're comfortable with the system to feel like they can't do anything else with that discipline. In fact, you can do anything else with that discipline if it makes sense within that discipline. So we wanted enough examples in there to define the discipline through those examples. So that if somebody said, I want to use mind to turn invisible it's like, well, that's a mystery thing. It doesn't, you know, your mind doesn't make you turn invisible. That's something more, more occultish um, versus the mind, which is like uh, the ability to, uh, t you know, telepathically move things or, you know, some of the standard uh, telekinetically move things. Uh, I mean, and things like that. Yeah. So enough structure there so that the, the players aren't uh, over or uh, feeling like it's just, you can do anything you want. It doesn't really matter what the discipline is. It should matter what the discipline is and what you're trying to do. And if you don't have that discipline, your character is not qualified to do that. Just like in D&D, if you are a wizard, you are not qualified to um, sneak attack or uh, you know something like that. There, there needs to be some delineation so that it feels like there's variety. Yeah, given, given that, if somebody wanted to to utilize say a say effect fire to cr to create a um to create a saber made of that made of that element is that is that something that they could do or would that or would that be pushing it um so one of the fundamentals of the rules is every L or every discipline offers a standard attack form and it doesn't matter how the user wants to define that um, now if your body you'd actually need the tool but if you're if you're elemental and you want to shape your flame to be like a blade, that's totally fine. And in both cases, the damage is the same. So the damage rate, the damage scale doesn't change based on the the item type. Um, it only changes based on uh, the roll. So if you have a high success, double rolls, you roll two dice for damage. So that increases your damage that way. And then there are um, empowered items that will have little bonuses like plus one plus two that kind of thing to the damage if they are empowered with say elemental stones or something like that so you know there's that there is some variety in there but it's not based on the type of weapon or um if you created a uh well let, let me give you another example we have enhanced item in the technology discipline or enhanced body in the body discipline both are manifestations and you can actually like increase the size of your weapon or or change your body momentarily into a weapon type and or to a more damaging um, type so when you enhance in that way it reduces the the difficulty scale so you have a better chance to hit mm -hmm. which then increases the chance to do more damage just based on the fact that you are maybe rolling two dice at a uh, lower target point so if you succeed at a three and a four then you're still rolling two damage dice because they're both successes
Yeah, in the in in that regard in that regard. Um when it comes to when it comes to the um disciplines that were not in the quick start, namely lore and mystery, um are those are the would those largely be considered knowledge based disciplines? Lore definitely is. Lore lore is uh actually is probably one of the most used disciplines because that is both your mundane knowledge of things and also your manifested uh, manifesting ability to um, uh, to find things out. <laughs> uh, so definitely that's a knowledge type of thing. And it belongs to the Selku who are essentially the essence of Gaia or the spirit of the of the realm mm -hmm. um, who would know those things. Mystery is much more the occult. It's more like, um, manipulating gravity with your with your power, turning invisible, traveling into other dimensions. Um, the, the kind of things that would be that would be more more of a ritual spellcaster. Yeah, you could you could consider them ritualistic, or if you were looking uh, at, like in D anD D, something uh, more like along the lines of a warlock uh, flavor. Mm -hmm. um, but even beyond that, kind of a uh, you know, kind of like a space alien kind of not even space alien but interdimensional um mindset the ixia don't interact um enthusiastically with the physical world around them or even the the environment of new Ovarden. they are totally focused inward and into other dimensions because that's where they find value yeah uh i will admit when i was going through the when i was going through the body um, discipline. I I ended up conjuring up images in the back of my head of utilizing body to use the kind of effects that would be that would be key based abilities in uh, in other games, not just the key based abilities of the monk in D in D and D, but the way key or chi or chi is used in a lot in a lot of wuxia based games like Legends of the Wulin or mm. the way um. Or, or, or the way the way similar effects might, effects might be used in 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 various in various works where martial characters are the are the focus and are able to do these post human abilities because of the amount of training that they've gone through. Right. Yes, I think that's fair. Now, when I personally think of the the Lamplack and the body, I. Uh, I think of the Lamplack culture as being um, a, a good uh, pop culture reference to Dothraki. Uh, but they're very athletic. They're very physically powerful. They are um, land survivors. They're good with weapons. So they are the melee martial type. Mm -hmm. Their manifesting ability then it allows them to enhance those things. It also allows them to more easily heal themselves. It also allows them to turn into... Uh, the Lamplack can actually... Uh, turn into animal forms or creature forms of other creatures that they've seen before, which is their innate ability, which is no other cult, no other culture has, nor would anybody who who picks up discipline in body um, later would have access to. Yeah. Now, with that in with that in mind. When it comes to combat, are you aiming to, are you aiming to for a high lethality approach or, not or a little bit less so? It's um, I I don't think I would initially have said it's high lethality, but the um the injury scale, as you've noted, you know it, it probably uh, it it's an increment of four. So, you know, the damage die is a D4, and at low uh, evolutions, that's uh, potentially a single hit from a, a creature. Um, but there are a lot of healing opportunities as well that are innate to certain cultures like the uh, Asgall with Song or the just the body's ability to heal itself. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say, and I have not experienced in here that um, in playtesting, that death is common by any means. Um, there are ways to avoid it, um, several ways, actually. 
Um, so I would say that it's a dangerous environment, mm -hmm. but I don't know that I would go so far to say it's high lethality. Um, but it's not like you, you never get to a point where you have so many hit points that it's just a slugfest. Yeah. Somebody's going to get whittled down pretty quickly. And we have a, a really serendipitous um, uh, encounter balance system that basically just worked out um, on its own. If the injury scale of the opponent matches the, the total injury scale of the part difficult encounter, um, if it's half that, then it's pretty much a standard encounter that the party should fairly easily win, but it's not just a walkover. Um, and, and that simple math has been a, a very exciting find because we, you know, I just kind of, we just kind of built these things together and then we're like, okay, here's injury scale. What does that mean? What does size factor mean? How does it look when you put it together and we throw things on the table and we mash them together and we're like, wow, that, that really works out well. Now, with that with that in mind, I'd like to go in a bit into um, advancement. Okay. Are you utilizing a points based adva adva advancement system with evolution? Is it a th is it a threshold approach, or is it or is it sim is it simply a um, a landmark uh, approach when it comes to advancement? Right. It's it's entirely uh, intuitive milestone like that yeah you know, i want um because there's not uh, 20 or 30 levels of development in this game um i thought it made a lot of sense for as the campaign's rolling along for the seer to estimate when the players are ready to evolve and and you know, how are the encounters going is the enjoyment there is it time then to reward them with advancement and worry about that intuitively mm -hmm. now with that, with that in mind, you referred you've referred to the game in the Kickstarter as a sci fantasy work, um, and the vibe that I get, the vibe that I ended up getting with that particular take on sci fantasy is has far less in common with say Star Wars and has far more in common with early with um early days of pulp. I'd say if I were if I were to use a pop culture analogy, um, John Carter. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. The technology or the sci aspect to it is much more subtle. It's not a science fiction game, um, but there is in the lore this, the history of the lamb plaque. And so New of Arden takes place a hundred years after the emergence. So when this paradigm shifted and all these new cultures rose, it's been about a hundred years. So five generations, mm -hmm. there are some people alive in the lore, in the culture, who remember that day. Um, the knowledge that there was this technology that the Land Plague people had, but have lost that understanding of it, doesn't, it, it still, um, there are rumors and stories about, you know, great forges um, in the mountains and, um, airships perhaps that existed at one point. And as the explorers go out, because the, the point of New of Arden as a game is that the players are taking characters into a landscape that is so vastly changed that everyone is learning about it by going out into it. Um, the new cultures don't have the past history, or well, they, the uh, Selku have the past history. And so there's knowledge of what happened before the emergence, but there's no knowledge about what things are like, you know, on a vast scale now. And so they're finding that out. And as they find that out, they find these artifacts that, um, that exist. And there's, there's also a level of, um, of uh, like legendary item that we call rumor relics that exist out there as well and where they came from and who made them. And, um, and then the land plaque themselves had this ability of technology. I think of it sometimes in terms of like great um, legendary dwarven technology with the uh, iron or the, you know, the cogs and the machinery and, and that kind of thing. It plays off that a little bit, but it's also open-ended so that the seer can use their imagination and what they want in their world for that technology to look like. And that, that comes down to the science aspect, but we also have a crafting system, um, which is a little sciencey. Um, we have a harvest craft and barter system as the economy instead of a coin based mon uh, money system. 
So it all works together. You, you encounter things, you collect them, they have value, you turn them into other things, it increases the value, you trade them and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. And give, given that, given that it's, it sounds like, it sounds like there's more of a focus on, um, bar, on bartering than there is on a universal currency. Yeah, absolutely. The currency is in the value of the things that, that are collected and traded. Mm -hmm. Now, I know I've t we've touched on, a f we've touched on a few of the disciplines but there's one there's one that I'm curious about on how on how this will how how this p could potentially manifest because there's a lot of ways I can th I can see it and I'm curious what would be a few examples of it and that is the mind and tech disciplines okay mm -hmm. so mind is the one that the starnum retained after they lost everything else which for them was an apocalypse um, they are also largely formless. They are a plasma form, uh, but they their mind ability allows them to um, move into other physical creatures and inhabit them, and that is their innate ability. So then they can interact more directly with the physical world and um, also hide themselves better if they don't want to be noticed as a starnum because there's a bit of a you know bad rep on them <laughs> for what they did uh, in this world. Um, and then mind also does things like, you know, telepathy, telekinesis, um, mind shielding. Um. I'm curious if mind could, if mind could, um, could pull, could pull a move straight out of the shadow. If you'll forgive me for going full pulp in, for a moment. <laughs> in, uh, like what would, what would the example be? Oh. Um. Well, are, are you familiar with the shadow as far as the character? You know, what evil lies within the hearts of men? Yeah. I, I mean, vaguely, sure. Um, his whole thing is being, able, is being able to cloud minds in order to... Um, in, or, in order to conceal his presence. So that he's... He, so that he's in... He's essentially in the room, but people can't see him. Okay, so sort of invisible or... Uh obscured mm -hmm. we actually have so we have status effects in the game and one of them is obscured and what obscure does is it increases the difficulty scale to be detected uh, based on certain factors and um, if a if a player were to make an argument that they would like to befuddle the mind of a target uh, so as to be obscured that definitely would be I would think that that'd be perfectly negotiable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's it's so. What would happen then is it that obs that uh, obscurement is entirely based on the fact that this befuddlement has happened, not based on the fact that you're actually physically invisible or physically silent or anything like that. So you know, so there is some room there. Like, if something changed in the environment, it could affect that obscurement or you know, in some way, who knows? Uh, it's that kind of variability that I really like mm -hmm. that I'm really, that we're really going for so that it's not entirely predictable and it's not so rote, you know, like there's not a block of text um, that's a half a page long that says exactly what you're limited to. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And then with tech, sorry, with tech, tech is uh, tech is the, purview of the Wotan who are sort of these like construct people who literally became technology and um, they're able to create technological items. Um, they're able to repair technology in the, in the moment, enhance it, um, create, uh, you know, shelter or constructs cover things like that temporarily and, and permanently, depending on the situation. And they're also, there are also subcultures associated with the culture. So there are actually 15 player character options in the entire rule system. And the, uh, the Mastercraft, which we call the, the Wotanla, can actually uh, create the empowered items like the plus one and plus two gemstone weapons and things like that. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that kind of thing in mind, 
Since you mentioned you mentioned monst mentioned uh, monsters and enc and encounters and the like, um, the couple questions that I have on that is how is how do you how do you scale how do you scale that how do you scale them in re in relation to pl in relation to players, like i.e. i.e. do you use some um, parallel to evolution, a la, a la um, CR in D and D. Or do you go a bit more freeform? Mm -hmm. So, so in relation to that, um, so each creature has uh, an injury scale, just like the players do, mm -hmm. and they have a size factor, and the size factor is just more like, you know, how physically large is this creature? And we have a table for that as well. Mm -hmm. the uh, The formula, though, is simply say you have uh, an IS twelve monster, so it has twelve hit points. And you have a party of evolution one characters. The character IS is 16 combined. And 16 to 12 means that the characters have a slight advantage in combat against one of those creatures. Um, if the creature IS equals or exceeds the, the party's combined IS, then the encounter is difficult to theory, you know, to deadly really. Um, so two IS 12 monsters against uh, an evolution one or two party that has a combined total of 16 IS 16 to 24 is going to favor the monsters fairly substantially. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of that, when it comes to combat, whenever you have some sort of limited resource, there is the tendency among players to, to um, be conservative with it, or put it, f or put it aside for a special occasion, and in the extreme forms, you have what I like to call the ninety-nine mega elixir problem. <laughs> oh, you know, or also known as the rainy day paradox of somebody saving, saving, saving a certain item for a rainy day, even though that day never comes, and it's the end of the campaign, and that, and yeah. the adventure is done, and they didn't use that thing. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we have not experienced the the players are not cautious at all. We, we've had several um, playtest sessions already with a number of different people. Uh, some of them are actually on VOD on various uh, on YouTube. There are uh, two different um, series on there that folks can watch if they want to. Um, but people are not afraid to use their primacy scale, and there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, they need it. Um, Second of all, there's a mechanic in the in the rules where if you roll double twos or double threes, you get what's called recovery. And recovery allows you, it's a failure on your attempted act, whatever you tried to do, but it allows you to recover armor factors, uh, health or injury scale, uh, remove a condition, a status effect if you're under a status effect, or recover a primacy scale. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people will roll a two one, which is a high failure, and they face a uh, reprisal, which means they could they could be injured. And sometimes people strategically will change the one to a two and get double twos and then just take that point back. And so there are ways to preserve them. And then um, there are also tinctures that you can collect or make that allow you to recover spent primacy scale at um, evolution four, once per day, you can completely recover your primacy scale from where you're at to max um, as an act action. Uh, and then there are things like natural uh, environmental effects, something uh, we call black water. So in the black water, you come upon a black water lake, and if you drink from that source, it restores your primacy. Or if you get caught in a black water rainstorm, which is rare, but uh, mm -hmm. weather's a whole different kind of factor there. Re weather very rarely changes. A new Varden, um, what the seer does is they roll 3d4, and if it rolls triples, that storm happens at some point in the day. Otherwise, the the weather patterns are like San Diego; they're the same every day. Mm -hmm. Now, taking that now taking that into into account, pretty accurate for you to bring up that little bit of joke about San Francisco weather. I'd imagine the <laughs> forecaster probably has the easiest job in the world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? Well, right now it's, I would say between 240 and 300. I don't know if it'll quite get to 300. We, we initially wanted to um, create a, a player's book and a, a seer's book. So it'd be like 100 and 150 or something like that. Um, it, and it all depends on you know funding because expenses all go up when you try to do that in a practical sense. But let's just assume it's a combined volume. Um, I do want to have a number of tables in there. I think people like tables. I like tables. And uh, so I want a, a pretty robust table section for even for things like you, you walk into a ruins, you know, what side of town do you walk into? What, what was this area that you arrive in? So the seer isn't, especially in a new setting like this, the seer isn't having to pull it out of the air all the time. Um, they've got some guidance on what the setting looks like because, you know, the setting, the colors of the world are different here, um, let alone, you know, the sky's not blue, the sky's amber. The seer needs to know that. You know, the foliage a lot of times is purple and blue and lavender and in addition to green or yellow. It's not just green grass and, you know, stuff like that. So, um, and then we have a 30 monster uh, bestiary standard and um, have uh, high hopes of expanding that, uh, making an expansion to even add to that. But uh, we also are creating monsters that are not, you know, uh, I just did a play test um, for another uh, channel not too long ago. And, and they said, I, I know what a gelatinous cube is. I know what a dragon is. I've never seen that <laughs> the creature that, that I ran them into in this game. And that's what I'm going for there as well. I want monsters that feel like something different, mm -hmm. but it, you know, and that adds to the page. I mean, it adds to the page count. I want, I, I thought 30 monsters plus is a nice, that's a nice little bestiary for a core rule book. Mm -hmm. Um, have you get have you given consideration to put to putting in to putting in a section regarding advice for creating mon for creating monsters for the GM? Yeah, at the front of the monster section, there is actually a guide and a um, a uh, template for the stat block. So, absolutely, um, there's a lot of room for seers to create their own stuff, their own relic items, their own empowered items, their own um, monsters. All right, now Definitely. I'll, I'll certainly be looking forward to that because putting, putting in degrees of customization like that, I think is, I think is very important. Yeah, I agree. As, as um, even with, even the biggest game that has the largest amount of of potential monsters there's going to be a mo there's not all of them are going to fit the kind of story that the dm wants to tell and i right. I, I know it's supposed to be seer in this game i just use dm as a kind of habit yeah, sure. thing sure no i mean i have i have three of cobalt presses monster tomes i have you know, the the fifth edition monster manuals i've got files and there's still things sometimes i'm like I, don't, I either can't find it <laughs> looking through all these things or uh, or it's not what I'm looking for for this encounter. Or in some cases you don't want you want you want to curve around um, people being a bit genre savvy, shall I say? Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good way to put it. I had to I've had a few cases where somebody, where some players were dumb enough to think that having a T-Rex as an enemy means that they could pull that same don't move stunt from Jurassic Park. <laughs> I mean, you can allow a try, right? <laughs> um, I never, I never said they, they assumed that I was going to do it and that I, I was going to do the vision is movement thing. And then, and then they acted, and then they acted surprised when one of, when one of the guys is hirelings ends up getting om nommed. <laughs> and afterwards, afterwards he was like, what the hell, man? Why, why didn't you tell, why didn't you tell me that the move still thing didn't work? <laughs> 
I didn't have I didn't tell you anything. You assumed it wasn't going to work, and you know what they say about people yeah. who assume. Exactly. Exactly. As I well, always thought I always thought that was kind of ridiculous because it's not like it it's not like that thing has a couple of giant nostrils or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> doesn't know how to survive on creatures that know how to try to hide from it. Yeah. Well, I, I, this actually, that's kind of a side point, but it speaks to, you know, player assumption and, and, uh, and things like that. And I, I, it risks taking away something from the game for me. If I think I know all this stuff already, like where's the, you know, this is a, this is a game about adventure and challenge and heroics and overcoming and sometimes succumbing to failure and death. And uh, it's much more interesting when that storyline can play out than it is to just know everything. And and maybe I'm speaking like someone, I'm, I'm showing my hand that I'm not a big power gamer, but um, to me, the story is what matters. I've always held the be- I've always held the belief that story and story and mechanics should not be treated as if they're mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm. I um, I actually, I actually, I've actually been very critical of people who use who use the story is what matters thing as a um, get out of jail free card when it comes to cer- when it comes to certain mechanics um, uh-huh. espe- especially re- especially given my eternal burning hatred of the Vancian spell system uh-huh. uh, the whole spe- the whole spells per- the whole spell slots and spells per day in D&D I have I hated it when I started out as a kid that feeling has not changed as an adult. <laughs> well, and that speaks directly to this design. I, I didn't want those kind of limitations here. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, other limitations, sure. There has to be some sort of challenge, but I'm, I prefer I prefer limitations that that actually make that actually make some degree of ne- of um, narrative and mechanical sense. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why the Vancian model has been my whipping boy because I was un- I was un- because there never seemed a good there never seemed to be a good narrative rationalization why a- why I need to memorize my spells and I and have to redo this process every day and ne- I need to rest for eight hours in order to recover all my spells. I can understand it from a gameplay perspective, i.e. you don't want people throwing fireball all the damn time. Mm-hmm. But how am I supposed to how am I supposed to story-wise justify running out of spell slots, for instance? It yeah, it does feel it does feel kind of crummy when you're the one who's who's subject to that. Uh, I, I guess as a system, as a system, it's nice to have in the library, but as the system, maybe Maybe not so exciting. Well, the other thing was, it's based on the Dying Earth books, mm-hmm. and Dying Earth is very sword and sorcery adjacent. Mm-hmm. Whereas the supposed default setting of D and D, I'd be hard pressed to call that sword and sorcery adjacent. I think that's a great point. Actually, I hadn't thought about it before, but sword and sorcery is what got me into first edition, and that's where I start getting OSE. Uh, palpitations with 5e because 5e's uh i don't know i don't know if it's even uh maybe eddings uh that's as far back you know that's the early fantasy that i can think of um or or maybe it's something completely different as far as the setting goes now where it's so favorable to the to the player characters for one thing um but it's it's much more of a robust kind of or dynamic world than a sword and sorcery world which is very um steel and shadows the thing the thing about magic and sword and sorcery settings is that magic is treated as extremely rare and extremely dangerous um mm-hmm. most sword and sorcery are outright rpg rpgs that build themselves as such sometimes have some sort of corruption or some sort of bad mojo kind of motif with magic or magic is highly ritualized yeah um in call of cthulhu casting magic costs sanity and Mm -hmm. and in order to even utilize magic you need you need you need to have a proper source to re to research from and even that and even then 
the stuff that you can do with magic is not at, is not going to be as widespread. You right. Know, basic basically if somebody's going to be dipping into ma into magic, they have to be extremely de extremely dedicated to it and it causes a whole lot of drawbacks. Yeah. Um the the um the magic system back back in back when I covered Blade of the Iron Throne, um casting magic always had a risk of getting corruption and too much corruption would basically turn your PC into an NPC. But when you look at the Vancian model, even in the early days, that wasn't that wasn't present, and of course I could go into how D and D is has a, um, for lack of a better term, shit or get off the pot attitude regarding what kind of fantasy it is over the years, <laughs> because consider the consider the consider the authors who were influences, Moorcock, Tolkien, Vance. Howard. Yeah. All of them are technically fantasy authors, but that's where the Venn diagram begins and ends. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, great point. So it kind of waters it down in a way because it's trying to be everything. And when you try when you try it and please everyone, you please no one. I've no. I've been of the I've been of the mindset that a a fantasy a fantasy setting should pick a lane and stick to it because it can't do all of them at once. Yeah. Uh, it, and my players in D&D &D know that uh, I try to create certain funnels to limit some of that as well because I, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I really agree. And I uh, it, it confuses some of the, especially the younger players um, who come out of certain pop cultural references where they sort of think that it should be the way they imagine and not restricted. You know, there's a lot of argument for that. Uh, all over the place, but um, you know, it, it, story. I mean, a novelist doesn't write everything no. and make a good book. So it's the same idea. It makes me you make me think of of Neil Varden though, and and what are the costs of manifesting? Um, and there are you, you risk injuring yourself if you fail. You risk injuring your allies because you don't get to sculpt your manifestation around the target area. Um. It's things so you like get that. To deal so, with the biggest oxymoron in history, friendly fire. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you want to push the monster away, you're going to push your friend too. <laughs> uh, which is and I'm not I'm obviously I'm not I'm not saying that um that ca that there shouldn't be that there shouldn't be restrictions, just that the restrictions that are present should at, should make should make sense. Yeah. Uh, and of course, of course, the of course the other thing the other thing that I end up that ends up putting me on the outs with some with some folks in the D and D crowd is my adi my attitude about reducing the caster non caster gap that can happen. Mm -hmm. Oh. My good friend Tanner put it best where he said that in some games, casters get more game out of the game. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, fortunately, that, that that's something that isn't as much of an issue because uh, because of how freeform um, Novardin is. But I'm pretty sure you've seen that of, say, um, fighters being treated as Babby's first character. Right. I'm playing a fighter right now after all my years of, of experience just because I really wanted to, to be that that tough, mm. you know. But the casters all stand, stand around me and um, do things from afar, and I'm always, you know, like trying to jump up and <laughs> swing my sword at, at stuff. And it does feel oddly limiting uh, for what you think of when you think of a really good, someone who's supposedly really good at what they do. Well... I know that the selling point has been they can u they can utilize any kind of weapon, but that's a bit of a cold comfort when most people will pick one particular weapon style and generally stick to it. Mm -hmm. Like somebody who starts out going sword and board is probably going to be sword and board for the for the rest of their adventuring career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and, you get attached to your stuff. Well, that that and. The amount of the amount of time you have to go through in order to switch weapons in combat 
isn't worth it for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But I gen but I but moreover there's the there's the issue of the martial character doing some variation of the basic attack and very little else as opposed to the caster who's just swimming in options to utilize in the action economy. Right, right. Yeah, so no, in New of Arden, if you are playing a martial type, the the Lamplack, for example, or you're starting off with body because you're a Lamplack, uh, you can still manifest from the beginning. You just manifest differently than somebody else does. And, of course, that's what we want. The one limitation that a, a melee fighter has in New of Arden is that ranged weapons are a technology discipline. So in order to use primacy, you have to have the technology discipline. So a land plaque at low evolution is using a bow, for example, without the benefit of being able to apply primacy. But after that, it then encourages them to pick up that technology discipline, to learn how to use that bow as they develop and become more rounded in that way. Um, but meanwhile, they can still turn into an animal that they've seen before. They can still make their knuckles, you know, their, their knuckles pierce out of their skin and, mm -hmm. you know, do extra damage and things like that. Which cer certainly makes sense. Uh but with all, with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to the temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Oh, my pleasure. I really appreciate you having me on. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, whether whether it's to further go into Novarden or to laugh at the bar, at the bard for being useless again or the <laughs> failed experiment that was assassins in the early days. The door is always open. As I often say around Thank here, you. drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>